I think that's where it comes back to the motivation and, and, and what people sort of believe in. If you're, if your motivation is to ultimately support community sports, youth sports, then I think you wouldn't be looking for the same kind of return as simply buying shares in Nike. Um, but, you know, understanding that we're a startup, but our model's unique in that we, we don't really charge the teams. We, we, like I said, we're selling real estate on the kit and equipment as, as billboards to the sponsors. Have you ever wondered what it takes to successfully raise money? I have worked with hundreds of capital campaigns across dozens of industries, and I'm here to share with you proven methods for raising money in record time and at the lowest cost, while also obtaining capital at the lowest price. My name is Carl Dakin, and welcome to Motivated Money. Welcome everyone. This is Carl Dakin with Motivated Money. We are here to talk about raising capital and the best ways to get that done. I have with me today as my guest, Michael Feely, who is the CEO for Citizen Sports and uh, also uh, working with me on the Citizen Sports Foundation, charitable um, nonprofit that we're putting together. And uh, we're going to talk about motivation. So, uh, Michael, uh, uh, introduce yourself. Talk a little bit about Citizen Sports. Thanks for having me, Carl. Uh, my name's Michael Feely. I'm the founder of Citizen Sports and its sister organization, uh, Citizen Sports Foundation. Um, what we believe is that sport belongs to all of us. And so our mission is to try and make sport more affordable, more accessible uh, for all all levels of sports participation, all members of the community. Um, we are looking to try and do business a little bit differently from the way it's traditionally done in sport. And essentially, Citizen Sports is a, is a kit company that, with a bit of a twist, we, instead of sell kit to the teams, we, we sell real estate on the kit to sponsors in order to bring in the funding to provide the kit for teams. And, and the idea is that that reduces the cost of participation because players don't have to pay as much in dues or fees in order to be able to provide the equipment they need to participate or there's not additional charges beyond the dues fees um, like that traditional clubs will charge. And part of that as well with, uh, with the foundation is that we want to focus on infrastructure um, playing fields, clubhouses, facilities, uh, safe space for people to, you know, shower and change, go to the bathroom whilst they're participating. So it's it's kind of on the one side is is operational, and on the other side is more sort of infrastructure and land development. Well, very good. And um, so when we talk about motivation, uh, we're going to be talking about this from the standpoint of the motivated money approach to raising capital. And, and in this approach, uh, what we're talking about is that when somebody goes out and pitches for money, uh, they're going to pitch to somebody who may become an investor. And uh, for that person to make a decision to place their money at risk, whether it's with a for-profit entity or they're making a charitable contribution to a charity, they have to get something right in their head that says, this is the thing that I want to do. And within the motivated money approach, uh, we're trying to get into the head. We're trying to get in the psychology of this is what motivates them to make that decision. And, and this is very important from several aspects, because if I'm talking with someone who's a candidate and they have no motivation today and never will have, then I'm wasting my time and energy and making a pitch to that person. I don't have time to talk to everybody. I can't knock on every door. I, I don't need to know another set of no's or 20 no's by noon uh, to make my day. I need to be talking to somebody who is actually going to do that. So as we go through the motivated money approach, we start creating profiles of people who have an interest in the outcome of the organization, uh, where that outcome benefits them and it's a self-interest for them to support or to invest into that business or that organization. And then within that group, we're trying to narrow it down to who cares most, who loves you more than you love yourself. 
And that's what we, when we talk about with motivation. So starting with that, uh, Mike, um, we're, we're talking about citizen sports to begin with. Who would invest in citizen sports? Who would benefit from the success of all the good work that you're doing in setting up new teams and getting the money to pay for equipment, travel, and insurance? Well, there's all kinds of different people that might have some level of interest. But uh, if you want to sort of talk about being more focused about who is best interested, best motivated, we need to look at stakeholders, who stands to benefit from the success of our organization. Um, that would be various different suppliers or vendors. Uh, manufacturers of kit and, kit and equipment might be someone that would have an interest in, in, in providing funding to us to be able to grow, to be able to start more teams, to be able to bring in more revenue through sponsorships to fund these programs because ultimately they will benefit from sales going back the other way uh, to supply those needs. It's the yes. same thing with different, different groups. If you talk about um, private landowners with sports facilities, although there's not too many of those in the U S under the sort of traditional model, but um, ultimately it's, it's someone that seeks or stands to win sort of as part of the process, but also um, alongside the process. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of an interesting thing because most people go, I'm going to go to an investor because I'm going to make them rich. Um, whether that's true or not, or whether the probability ever occurs, uh, but it, it's a very one-dimensional motivation. And uh, it has a number of problems in that even if uh, you gave them 100% of your company, you still may not make them rich. And that doesn't leave any money left over for you. Uh, and uh, at the same time, if you only have that one dimension uh, of the benefit being only in terms of making them more money than they invested, um, you have to compete with everybody else who says they can do the same thing. So when we shift over to stakeholders, you identified uh, a number of different stakeholders uh, who stand to benefit if you go forward. And one of those being a vendor to you. So uh, as an example, somebody uh, makes a jersey, uh, you buy the jersey and you give it to the team. Uh, they have every interest in selling you more jerseys so you can give them to more teams. And that puts money in their pocket. So th they would have a natural motivation to say, hey, uh, Michael, I hear you're looking for some money. Um, I have a reason to give you some money because I not only will make money on my investment, but I will sell you more product and I'm going to make profits on selling to you more products. So I'm getting two for out of it. And, and that's a really good direct monetary motivation. Then you mentioned people who just want to see more kids playing sports. Now this gets a little more difficult. What kind of motivation would you say that is? Well, it's kind of the value added. So you've got the first two wins like you talk about, but it might be someone that owns a company that has kids of sports playing age. It might be someone that owns a company that plays adult community sport themselves. Um, but it's also like a third benefit, additional value added is that it looks good in the community. Look, see what we're doing. Pat yourself on the back, get the community to pat you on the back. It's um, a, a general sort of goodwill motivation as well. So, you know, I think we all agree that community sports or youth sports in particular are a, a general sort of social good. And, and I think that, you know, you see it from the NFL down to peewee or, you know, little league baseball or peewee football or anything like that, where companies love to be associated with sports companies that advertise using sports or sports as a, as a partner of a company makes them makes the community or makes the public think that that company is more trustworthy than sort of generic advertisements. So that's even a fourth win. If you, if you're well, making let, money in the investment, you're making money. Let's talk about that a little bit, Michael, because um, ordinarily what happens is a local business is hit up by a youth nonprofit organization to make a charitable donation. And, and that's a good thing. We're all for it. But uh, what's been your experience on the, the size of dollars that a business is willing to, to make in terms of a donation when compared and contrasted with 
how much money that business may provide to uh, that organization if it's in the form of advertising and sponsorship? Uh, typically, it's a bigger budget. So they would, you know, everyone's okay writing a check for a certain amount if it's just a thank you very much, here you go. And everyone sort of wipes their hands of it. But if if you're able to provide more benefits and, and additional marketing, additional eyeballs, this additional visibility, you know, those things should lead to um, brand recognition, trustworthiness, increased revenue, although it's not particularly measurable specifically. Um, but over time, you would hope to sort of see a, a better return that way. Businesses are more inclined to spend a little bit more if they see that that's part of the plan. So you, you're more likely to, um, to get more money from it. It's, I think, four times, benevolent budget is a certain amount, but marketing budgets are about four times the size. Yeah, so people want to be associated with the goodwill stuff, but it's an extra win. It's an extra win. You provide benefit. Yeah, and this is one of the things we talk about at Motivated Money is uh, engineering stakeholders or engineering benefits. Um, if you take an organization, any organization, people are going to benefit from that. But sometimes within the scope of your offering and putting together your capital campaign, you may be able to amplify that benefit to turn it up a notch or two or three because you structure the deal differently. And when you do that, you've just increased the motivation of that person to put money into your capital campaign. And, and it's interesting, as you've just described, that, yes, you could have a campaign that's a charitable campaign, just go out after donations. But in this case, Citizen Sports, acting as a broker, acting as an intermediary between the businesses and the youth organizations, they now can arrange for the business to get all kinds of public recognition, all kinds of feel good, and, and that all can translate down the road to a monetary reward uh, in addition to all the, all the public recognition that they're getting. Exactly. And I, I think also that if you're, if you're able to establish and deliver certain benefits, if you use different activities to leverage those benefits and increase exposure, it should develop into a longer term um, relationship. And, and ultimately what you want with sponsors uh, even more so than donate, uh, donations, is renewals. You want them to continue that relationship over time or even sign up for a longer period of time or commitment in the initial uh, sponsorship versus a one-off check, simple donation. So, you know, what, what you're trying to do when you're bringing in the money, whether it's sponsorship, whether it's investment, is to set yourself up to grow and, and be established and sustainable long-term. So, the longer you have partnerships or relationships, um, the the easier that should make it. The more stable you should be, the 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 better you'll be able to focus on delivering those benefits, delivering that return. Yeah, I mean, you, you've got the additional benefit that you don't have to go through the full sales cycle all over again. You're simply uh, rinse, repeat, wash, or whatever that sequence is. Uh, and uh, and so the result is you're more efficient in, in raising capital. And, and in this case, you're generating revenue uh, to citizen sports. And in turn, you are making all this available, less your commission to the sports team. Uh, but it, it changes the dynamic uh, because the, the beneficiary, the motivation uh, is offered up in a way where the business can understand it uh, in a way that quite often the charitable organization doesn't understand, can't explain, can't pitch it correctly. So uh, it, this is an indirect flow of money from businesses to youth sports teams and other sports teams all the way up the cycle to the pros of sponsorship. Now, this is well known at the professional level. You've never seen a NASCAR racer without 20 different emblems on their jackets and jerseys. And they know what they're doing. <laughs> they know what they're doing. Um, and this is just bringing this down to uh, everybody's backyard, everybody's community, as far as raising capital for the team, uh, where you're acting in a, a broker role of uh, making this all happen. Um, what has been the, the experience of the businesses that you've worked with when you 
uh, have given them this pitch, and, and then those who have put money into the sports teams, what have been their reaction? Um, well, so far, so good. Um, I think we had a couple sponsors uh, for our pilot with Pirate U Sports that probably weren't the best fit, and we we weren't necessarily able to to provide as much benefit as we'd like. We're still working on some of those uh, deliverables. Um, in terms of other businesses, great exposure, um, much more than they expected. The different events that we hosted, such as um, sponsor speed dating or the presentation day where we had the kids there with all the gear, uh, wearing the jerseys, stuff like that. It's more than anyone else has ever done. And, and it comes back to what you had mentioned about efficiency. Um, if, you, if you've reduced the sales cycle and then you're also more efficient with the money that you've that you've brought in, you're, you're stretching that dollar even further. It's, it's a sort of self-fulfilling leverage uh, or sort of mechanism to, to stretch those dollars as you're moving forward. So once, you know, if we're able to sort of refine and better define some of these processes, some of the benefits, some of the deliverables um, in terms of timeline, I think that um, they'll, they'll continue to be happy or become even happier with it. Well, I think there's been a lot of positive feedback. Let's step back a little bit. So now uh, go back to the very beginning when Citizen Sports was first formed and you were a business selling uh, sports gear, sports kits, things along that line. How would you be viewed uh, when compared with the other thousand businesses who are also selling sports gear and, and, and stuff from an investor standpoint? I think that's where it comes back to the motivation and, and, and what people sort of believe in. If you're if your motivation is to ultimately support community sports, youth sports, then I think you wouldn't be looking for the same kind of return as simply buying shares in Nike. Um, but, you know, understanding that we're a startup, but our model's unique in that we, we don't really charge the teams. We, we, like I said, we're selling real estate on the kit and equipment as, as billboards to the sponsors. So we're definitely sort of, trying to innovate in that sense where we are, are, are bringing in the money from the outside to, to provide these things um, to be able to lower cost. And, and that's kind of what we did with the pirates uh, pirate youth sports and the pilot program was that we were able to reduce the cost of participation by 90%. Translate that to what it means for a kid who's disadvantaged economically and their ability to participate on that team. Uh, we, well, it's a, it's a bit of a list, but I'll go through it. Um, our kids received 10 weeks of, of rugby training. All the fields were paid for, the coaches, some of the coaches were paid. Um, they got a ball, a hat, two jerseys, a polo, a T-shirt, and a hoodie. Uh, they also got um, like a club breakfast and some tickets to go to watch the USA versus Chile World Cup qualifier, although not a lot of the kids could make it, so we took more parents. but. Um, the total cost of all of that was around 400 bucks and they paid $30. So, yeah, so this is one of the common problems we've seen in youth sports today is that there are a lot of organizations who provide leagues and teams and so forth. Uh, and some are completely dependent upon charitable donations. And, and it, it becomes where the cost kind of passes through to the parent. And if the parent can't afford to pass through, the kid can't play. And, uh, and if they're in a neighborhood where not everybody's got the money, uh, there may be no team, no league, no play. And, and creating this system with the, the higher dollars going through uh, and keeping the cost down to the kid, uh, that's directly benefiting everybody in the community. And, and again, there's a motivation and there becomes a new stakeholder. Uh, everybody in the community goes, this is good for me. I like to have kids playing sports in my backyard. I like to, to see them, you know, participating in sports and all the things that are good about sports and everybody can afford it this way where the other way, uh, they can't come up with a thousand dollars, 1500, $2,000, $5,000 to be on a club team and travel all over the place. Um, it's just too expensive. So, uh, we start seeing a haves and haves not taking place within the, the youth sports uh, situation. So I, I really uh, am impressed with you know what's been accomplished so far and looking forward to where you're going forward. 
Uh, do you see new stakeholders coming into existence as uh, citizen sports grows up and scales? Uh, do you see something happening in, in terms of um, your interaction with Citizen Sports Foundation as it gets itself launched? Um, yeah, I think, um, well, one of the things that I missed out when we were talking about it, but participants are probably the biggest stakeholder. They've got the most to gain or lose, so so to speak, and that would translate down to the parents. Um, and or, again, that goes across a wide range of socioeconomic statuses. So some people could invest, some people couldn't. It's just, that's just the way it works out. But they would certainly benefit from it, um, particularly if it's helping fund their child's sports program and they're making a profit from the company later on. So as we grow, that might become a, a situation where larger clubs or teams or leagues might want to invest in, in that sense. We might do that as an equity stake. It might be done as a, a membership stake um, to be determined. But again, the same thing with, with Citizen Sports Foundation. If, if we're creating programs and participation then we're creating and we're creating demand for all the kit and equipment we're also creating a demand for facilities so if the foundation is able to pick up land purchase and develop land and and, and create places for people to play um it would behoove it to support citizen sports to create programs so that they're in their facilities are in use um, the same thing would be true for parks and recs departments or stuff like that. Now, I know it's complicated with municipalities and how they may or may not invest, but there's certainly um, connections through those sort of groups to chambers of commerce and such and so, and so on and so forth. So um, I think really anyone could be a stakeholder. It, de it depends how, how tight or tenuous that relationship to community sport may be. But certainly the closer they are to participating or knowing a participant and the closer they are to, to selling a product that sort of facilitates that, then the more motivated, the more motivated they will become. But um, I think just going back as well, sorry, shameless plug, but one of our sponsors for Pirate Youth Sports, the Breakfast Queen, when we did a promo video, um, just talking about additional benefits, was it, it keeps people out of trouble. If they're playing sports, it's a, a, a positive, productive sort of use of their time and, and, and teamwork versus antisocial behaviours, which we know are prevalent in, in more deprived areas where kids don't have the opportunity to participate in sport. Yeah, and um, it, it, it's interesting then as you go through the analysis of who are the stakeholders, who stands to benefit from the success of everything Citizen Sports and Citizen Sports Foundation are doing individually and in tandem. And uh, it would seem everybody's a beneficiary, but you don't have time to talk to everybody. So at some point, uh, you've got you to assess the motivation. you got to like assign a value to that motivation because you want to talk to those people first who have the greatest motivation uh, so that you can speed your your capital campaign. So uh, right now, who would you view as being the the highest priority of people to talk to? Who are most likely to break out that checkbook and 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 write a check either to Citizen Sports or or even uh, making a donation to the foundation? I think the people that are most uh, desperate for fans, and and that's really any sort of pro sport or any pro sport franchise, it doesn't matter whether it's the NFL or rugby or soccer or cricket, anything, you know, at, at the end of the day, they're, they're trying to produce or acquire as many fans as possible for their own sponsors. Um, the reason that's important is, is basically two thirds of all sports viewership, sports fans were or are participants in the specific sport being viewed. So if you want more rugby fans, you need more rugby players. You need, you want more, Basketball fans, you need more basketball players. And again, it comes back to, or sort of to close the loop, um, making it more affordable and more accessible so that more people are able to participate. Um, yeah, professional yeah. sports teams are really motivated to, to increase participation because it'll increase fandom. Working your way down there, the same thing would be true for governing bodies or unions or anyone like that. Yeah, so the um, it's an interesting thing. Uh, professional sports are dependent 
upon new talent coming in year in and year out <coughs> in order to fill out their teams. Uh, mm-hmm. There was an interesting commentary over the weekend during the NFL uh, games that all the games were won by kickers. And everybody says, yeah, well, if you don't have a good kicker, go out and get one. Like you pull them off a shelf and they're a commodity when they're not. Um, and and it's true for the major sports as well as secondary sports. There may not be enough talent in the pool uh, to put a team on the field of quality that that creates the entertainment that actually creates the fans who watch and pay for and pay for a lot to watch uh, those games. So, uh, uh, what uh, have you talked to professional teams about? whether or not they should be uh, investing in or supporting uh, local youth programs? Um, tentatively, yes. Uh, we've reached out to a few different rugby organizations, um, mainly because rugby was the sport that I grew up with and know best and, and have the best networking. But um, at, at the end of the day, this applies to, like I said, any particular sport, any particular franchise within those sports, whatever level. Um, it's, it's funny we talk about sort of the, the fans being viewership that creates the money that pays the players and so on. Um, if you look at the WNBA now, but girls basketball participation is growing. It's growing slowly, but surely. Um, but it's not necessarily translating into enough uh, high level talent production. And it's definitely not translating into enough uh, committed fanatics fans. Um they're still able to go and watch the men's sports that, that are more entertaining and, and generate more revenue for that reason. And that's why the players make like LeBron James make the big bucks. You know, everyone wants to go and watch him play. So part of that is sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. If you do a better job of promoting the women's game and putting role models in front of youth, then there will be increased fandom, but that's also one of the catalysts for increased participation. You need to inspire players, youth to, to be able to dream and say, I want to make it to that level. Um, and that's true for professional teams. That's true for international teams where there's those kind of competitions like, like soccer. P- people are so busy trying to, to generate revenue and, and put on the product and the entertainment that sometimes they're sort of forgetting about producing fans and, and they're more trying to sort of acquire fans or bring them across from somewhere else. And I think you need to sort of take a, a two-pronged approach, but definitely um, have the ability to try and produce participation for a long-term fan production objective. And I don't think people are necessarily looking at it like that. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. Even in the motivated money approach where we can sit down and logically, rationally identify someone who will benefit, may be the greatest beneficiary of, of, of the success of a particular organization, it turns out that that particular stakeholder is unaware. And, yeah. and I've walked into meetings where I've said, uh, you know, have you ever thought about investing in such and such? And it's like an aha moment. You know, the light bulbs go off, uh, you hear the drums roll, and they're like, wow, that makes all kinds of sense. I I don't know why I didn't think about investing in my downstream or in my supply chain or or any of these other types of relationships that they're dependent upon. And and even today, we're uh, seeing a lot of markets. They're talking about there is no supply chain. We've got disruptions in supply chain. And when you go to the person who's complaining, you said, well, how often, how frequently did you invest in any other business in your supply chain? Um, you know, either to get a discount on product or to gain an equity position or just to get a, a front of the line privileges uh, when they run short on, on materials. And, and a lot of people just, well, I never thought about it. I've never done that before. And uh, now that I get to thinking about it a little bit, it, it actually makes all kinds of sense. So maybe, uh, you know, there's a whole group of investor candidates out there who are, are kind of in the dark at the moment. You're going to have to shine the light on the relationship. You're going to have to connect the dots to explain to them in your pitch that, hey, I'm, I'm talking to you because you're going to benefit from my success. Let me frame it out. Let me qualify it, uh, quantify it. And, uh, and then once you do that, uh, it changes the, the entire conversation from that point forward because uh, they're all thinking now of like, 
I'm acting in my own self-interest. It isn't like this guy came in and is hustling for money. Uh, I'm actually doing this for me. And, um, and the conversation changes. So and it, comes, and it comes back to the direct benefit, the indirect benefit. There's some roundabout ways that this comes back to you. There's some more obvious ways that this comes back to you. But at the end of the day, you know, what's in it for me is, is what makes them motivated. Yeah. And, is and it so, the warm and uh, fuzzies? Like, oh, because I'm supporting kids? Or is there a benefit beyond that and beyond that and beyond that? So. Yeah, and, and that's what we're here to talk about today. And unfortunately, we're out of time uh, today as well. Um, uh, Michael, uh, thank you very much for being here today on this episode of Motivated Money. Uh, I think that everybody who is listening in to today's podcast uh, is getting a, an insight as to uh, the stakeholder and motivation and what drives the investment decision. Uh, if uh, any of the listeners uh, I want some homework things to do this weekend. Uh, what we suggest you do is make a list of everybody who's going to benefit from the success of your organization. And then to the side, uh, write out why they benefit, what's going to drive them, what could be something that comes out of your success that translates into a monetary or non-monetary benefit to them. And, and how would you scale that? How would you grade that motivation so that you can start figuring out who to talk to first in your capital campaign, what you need to say, how to structure your deal, and, and get your campaign done and over with so you can get back to business? If you're looking for more uh, information on motivated money, please look at uh, the other podcasts. We're going to be talking about different elements uh, within the process uh, from A to Z. Uh, types of offerings, types of deals, uh, different types of campaigns that can be run. And um, we're also uh, you know, uh, going to be putting on a, a boot camp on motivated money. If you would like more information on that, go to uh, www.motivated.money and uh, you can learn about that. Uh, or if you're looking for services, please feel free to check out dakincapital.com. Um, there's uh, help there for people who want to raise capital in the design staging and management of capital campaigns. So that's it for today. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode of Motivated Money. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening in to Motivated Money. If you like this or any other episodes, make sure to leave a rating and review the show. We love to hear your feedback and want to make this the best possible show for you. Also, if you like this episode, make sure you share it with someone you know who is seeking to raise capital. They will appreciate learning what you now know about raising funding. I'll see you on the next episode of Motivated Money.